Hey, he doesn't. Hey, everyone. Hey, Michael. Uh, I just saw that Richie wrote that uh, he's uh, on the TOC call, so I don't know if there's a co-chair wanting to uh, take the lead. Uh, or, or I guess else. I guess Matt. I saw Matt uh, putting stuff on the agenda, so I'm assuming Matt will join. Great. By the way, I uh, had today a uh, recording of an episode of uh, Open Observability Talks. I hosted Richie. Uh, I'll, I'll compliment him uh, in his absence so he can't uh, object. And he did a fine job uh, representing um, tag observability and its role and its uh, uh, part in uh, the due diligence of uh, open metrics and uh, open telemetry and stuff. So uh, if you're interested in uh, listening, uh, I highly recommend it. Good PR for us. <laughs> Plus one, you you did a great job, and Richie, yeah, he did a did an awesome job there, um, explaining everything. I would just add it to the to the agenda, just FYI. Uh, I mean, the YouTube link is up there. I I was heckling in the background. <laughs> Actually, that's a it's a good idea. I'll put it on the uh, agenda for anyone uh, wanting to check it out. Thanks, and thanks for uh, for the feedback. Hello. Hey. Ah, uh, there's Richard. Yeah. We seem to have a problem with our invite. I couldn't join the call just now um, without logging in. I, I poked Amy. You can see them in the tech observability channel. Um, Maybe that's that's you, Richie. Everyone else managed to, like, literally yeah. all the people. Historically, we allowed non-locked in users, and now we are locking oh. out non-locked in users. Oh. Yeah, I had um, to lock in specifically changed. myself as well. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Okay, we, we can take a note to do that. Um, apologies for being a minute late. Um, Richie, did you already uh, sort of open proceedings? I think the recording started as I. Uh, no, I was stuck in the TOC call that runs slightly over, but. So. Um, so uh, just a uh, point of order, this is a CNCF um, uh, sponsored meeting. The CNCF code of conduct applies. Uh, as usual, uh, we're kind to our colleagues and we abide by that. Please don't put anything in the comments or uh, do anything that is a violation uh, of the code of conduct. Um, so we've got some guests today. Um, Richie, do you wanna, are there any? Oh, uh just before we get into the Octant team? No, I, no. Go ahead. <laughs> well, with that, um, welcome uh, to folks that are joining us from the Octant team. I will let you introduce yourselves because uh, you'll do a better job of that than I. Um, take it away, Wayne. Hi, yeah, uh, Wayne Wetzel. I work on Octant. And uh, yeah, I'll be showing it off today, just kind of walking through it for folks who haven't seen it before and answering any questions people might have about it. Uh, we have some other members of the team here in attendance hanging out, so uh, I'll let them introduce themselves. I'll hand it off to David. Hello everyone, good morning. David Espejo here, open source community manager for Octan. And thank you for, so much for your time and for um, giving us this space to showcase the project. Thank you. And I'll hand it off to uh, Liam. Hey guys, um, I'm Liam. I am an intern with the Octa team and I'm currently working on plugins. Um, and I will pass it off to um, Cara. Hi there, my name is Cara Yemenes. I'm the engineering manager for the Octa team. Uh, and I think Milan's the last person here we have from the team. Hello everybody, uh, Milan Kleinschek, uh, software engineer on Octa team. Um, glad to be here. Oh, I was wrong. I see Vikram here too. And Luis. And Luis. Oh, all right, more. Hey, everyone. I'm Vikram. I'm a software engineer with the Octane team. Glad to be here. And I'll pass it over to Luis. 
Hello, I am Luis, uh, software developer for the Arctan team. Um, yeah, I think Wayne is missing, isn't it? Or, I don't know. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's everyone. Yeah. So yeah, so thank you. Yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, is there anything um, before I get started with the presentation uh, for the meeting? Okay, awesome. Well, let me share my screen and we'll get going. A uh, quick poll in the in the chat. Uh, for folks who who has seen Octant before or ha is familiar with it uh, at all, uh, I guess I could start and say uh, in my day job we've been using it uh, almost since its inception um, as a way to debug workloads and and just type less. Excellent. All right. Uh, and is there anyone who'd be willing to just keep an eye on the chat for me as I go through things and call out any questions that might come up? David, do you mind doing that? Yeah, sure. We'll do Excellent. It. Thank you. Yeah. So um, is this uh, large enough font size good enough? Uh, does it need to be embiggened or is everyone? Yeah, embiggened. Sure. Okay. Embiggen a bit. It's going to add some scroll bars, sadly, but it's okay. And by a big, I mean a bit. I mean a lot. <laughs> ah, okay. I have a really large screen, and even I can't read it at the moment. Okay, do another one. Is that better, Richie? Yes. Thank okay. you. Uh, all right. So this is uh, Octant. Uh, let me just give a brief overview of of kind of what our mission and goal is with Octant. So. Uh, we like to think of Octant as a, a platform for Kubernetes developers to enable them to uh, troubleshoot, debug, and view their workloads. Um, uh, an analogy that I think long-term we're trying to shoot for is kind of being like the, the, the integrated development environment for, for Kubernetes. So, so, you know, with our plugin system, we like to think of, you know, that, that VS Code model of, you know, you come in, you start looking at things and, and you get told there's better ways to view this and you use plugins as a way to do that. Octant does ship with a set of, I guess, default modules or default plugins, if you will. They're, they're, they're not plugins because they're, they're baked into the core, but uh, they leverage all of the same API systems that uh, a plugin author would use. And, the, and so what I'm gonna show today is kind of walking through those defaults that we ship. And I'll, I'll also talk about some of the, the plugins that are out there in the ecosystem. Um, that I have installed here. So uh, with that, I'll just kind of get into it and uh, folks can can stop me and ask questions as I go. So this is what you will see when you first start Octant. This is the what we call the namespace overview. Um, Octant will, uh, you can provide it a namespace at startup or it will just kind of pick one by default. It'll pick default. So uh, I'll switch to that namespace just so you can see that um, there is a default namespace. Right now, what this is doing is, is going and pulling down all of the resources that are in that namespace. Uh, this namespace is not very interesting, uh, which is why I was using the, the Kubeflow one for this demo. Um, namespace overview is, has an opinion on the things you want to see for overview. So we, we show all of the, the core uh, Kubernetes resource types. Uh, then we also list your CRDs that you have, uh, or your custom resources, not CRDs, your custom resources that you have installed uh, in this namespace as well. Um, so, and then uh, finally we list the events that have happened within that namespace. So going back to that Kubeflow namespace we were in before, since it's a little more interesting, I'll start to walk through a set of resources, uh, specifically like deployments. And we'll just, I'll just kind of walk through a, a flow of looking at a deployment and watching it watching it move through the system. And then we can also look at some, some debugging. So we have a list of under this workloads uh, section, we have kind of a list of all of the individual types of workloads. This here that we're looking at is a deployment. We've got uh, our card sizing kind of auto sizes. So you'll see this, this uh, nice large edit button here, uh, but we have the status uh, as, as it's reported from the API. 
uh, any pods that are associated with this deployment conditions. Uh, this is a report here. This is actually coming from the Aqua Security plugin that I have installed. So, so this is this config audit report section that you're seeing here is not part of, of Core Octant. You, you would go run this command to generate a scan from Starboard, and then that uh, audit report would show up here. Uh, we also have the, the pod template and any events associated with this. Now we make best effort to kind of display this information in real time. So if I come in here and I adjust say up, up the replicas of this deployment, you'll see that uh, we get a, an alert that I've done so. And then uh, at some point the UI will refresh and we'll see that these pods are going independent. Um, uh, one of the ways you can also observe this is through what we call the resource viewer, which you saw it, as, it, as it just flipped to green to let me know that this deployment was okay. Uh, you can also instantly kind of see your last event, which was that we scaled it up to three. Uh, and you get to kind of walk through, I'll zoom out so you can see it all, but you get to walk through how your resources are all interconnected. Uh, with pods, it's a little different just because they're uh, a grouping. So you can see here are the three individual pods uh, that are here. And then you also get your, your last event. Uh, last event is the last event from the most recent pod in the group. Um, so it's, it's a little... It, it doesn't explicitly call that out, but that's where that, that comes from. Uh, one of the things that is nice about the resource viewer is when things aren't functioning correctly, you kind of get insights into that. So if I scale this down and I go into the resource viewer, you can instantly see that my, this pod group, right? It, it has, it is now shown these two pods as being in kind of in a warning state, um, because they're, they're going away. And, and we see that here that they are, are being deleted. And we'll also see the event here. That, there's, that we've scaled down. We can go into, for example, like the replica set. And once we load the replica set, we'll also see that same set of pods that, it, that it's controlling. And we'll see, here's the, the events specific to that replica set. Um, the resource viewer for that works in the same way, uh, except that the replica set will be the root resource. Um, whereas before when we were looking at it, right, the, the deployment was, was the root. Um, and now everything's back to being healthy. Uh, another way to kind of look at this is I can, I can scale this down to zero, right? And when that gets scaled down to zero, we'll see that the deployment, no replicas exist for the deployment. And it also goes into a kind of a detached state. Uh, we still manage to show that there uh, are things happening because this is still associated with it. But once that is, once uh, things are fully uh, removed here, so like this pod here as it's being deleted, once that's gone, when we go look at the resource viewer for deployment, we'll just see nothing there, but we'll be able to get to the event history and, and kind of have an idea of what's happening. Uh, one of the nice things about Octant as well is when you're viewing a resource as it's being deleted, you get to kind of see the events stream through. Um, and then as it goes away, it just kind of tells you, hey, that thing's, that thing's gone. Um, so, uh, it's, it's a nice way to kind of watch things happen. And then now you can see no associated resources with this thing. It doesn't know that the, like, because there's nothing here. Um, so I'll scale that back up just cause I don't know if someone's actually using it. <laughs> um, and, uh, so, so all, all of our resources, uh, they have a similar, uh, there's no cron jobs here right now. If there was, you would see them. And then there's actually a, you can pause them, re resume them, and, and, and trigger them from the UI. Um, but the, the overview page here will actually list all of these resources that you're seeing in the left-hand menu into a single page. Um, you can filter these lists. So if you say you only care about failed pods right now, you can go in and select failed. Um, or it, should you only care about stuff that's running, you can only do running, et cetera. Um, so here we have one that's an error. I actually have no idea why it's an error. Uh, oh, because no replicas exist. Uh, so we're going to, I haven't looked at this yet, so, but I'm going to go see if we can use Octane to kind of help us figure out why no replicas exist for this thing. Um, and well, that's progressing timed out. Yep. And hmm, interesting. So let's go drill down. What's happening here? Ah, so the service has no endpoint. That's different than that error. Uh, here we go. So if we look at our pod last event, we can see that it's attempting to uh, set up a volume for web cert object. 
uh, and it is not there. So, so the spec for, for these pods, the template for these pods is, is incorrectly configured or the resource that it's expecting to be there is not there, which is this volume mount here. So, um, that, that is, that's an example of using Octon to kind of quickly identify, Hey, what's the problem? Oh, and you can actually go into this event and, and see the full event here and, and go from there. So, um, so that, that's kind of the, that's kind of the quick overview of this namespace overview section. Uh, you know, each, each, each resource is, is kind of called out and, and you can go through and, and our, our back is, we have some things in the backlog to improve it, but for now you can at least, you know, you can see your roles, you can go into your roles, uh, and you, you can see kind of what the rules are for them. Uh, there's a long-term goal of being able to actually get like the, 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 all of the relate. Cause like, if I go here, I, you don't actually see what's using it. Right. So long-term goal is to be able to actually go and say like, Hey, show me everything that's using this role and all of the permissions, uh, uh that are inclusive with it. Um, so, so with, with that, uh, the namespace overview, any questions before I move on, I'm going to go through these kind of quickly cause we, we don't have a ton of time. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll go through each one and, um, pause for yeah. questions and then. Uh I would like to make sure that, you know, if we do kind of run short on, on time and, and we have some, some other things at the back end of the hour, uh, I, I do want to make sure that the plugins, um, and, and, and just the, the overall strategy, uh, what they are, why CNCF projects in particular might care. Um, that's probably at least from my perspective, one of the more interesting things to talk about for, uh, CNCF projects that, that that might want to leverage this open source tool, even though this tool is not part of the CNCF. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, I can, I'll go into that. Uh, I'll cover cluster overview very quickly and then I'll go into plugins. So, um, cluster overview is very similar to namespace overview, except it is focused on cluster scoped resources. So like if you're familiar with running like kubectl API resources command, uh, and, and there's that list of resources that come back as, as cluster scoped. Uh, that's what we try to focus on here, as well as some information around nodes and, and, um, details that are specific to the, to the cluster. Uh, and so we do best effort to try and go and list all of the known custom resource definitions that you have, um, and, and just, and show them here. Uh, this, this list is, uh, when you click into the custom resource, you can also see the versions. Uh, we don't have a diff between versions at the moment, uh, but that is something that has been requested. So you can see here I have 152, uh, I'll just extend this to make it a little easier to see. You can see that one's, uh, in process of being reconciled. Um, but yeah, as we go into these, the detail views for custom resources is not, uh, super useful yet, but it has enough there to, to, to kind of at least give you an idea of, of, you know, the group kind you know, all the names that you would expect to have on your API resources, uh, or your API version output. And, um, yeah, but I think that the, the, again, similar to other things within Octant, the resource viewer for custom resource definitions, it's not very useful right now. Um, there's probably ways to make it more useful, but we just haven't got there yet. Uh, nodes is a, is another one that, that folks, uh, use and, and have requested to, uh, have enhancements for, but it is, you know, y your list of nodes, um, the information about them, the set of conditions for the various, um, types and, or not types, but the, the, the status of the various conditions and, uh, the resources, you know, your information around CPU memory, uh, etc. So this one's, uh, fairly straightforward. Um, I think that's it for nodes. Uh, we do have uh, one thing I wanted to call out because I, I use it all the time actually, uh, is if you do control enter in Octant, you get this, you get this like quick switcher, which will, uh, I'll let you kind of fuzzy switch between areas of Octant. Uh, and it's really, really nice because it also, uh, does for example, the plugin menu, which is a good segue into plugins. Um, so <laughs> everything that you see uh, in the left-hand menu is what we would refer to in Octant as a module and everything below this cluster overview is a plugin. Uh, these are either written in Go or TypeScript. 
and they connect into Octant through our plugin API. And what Octant provides them access to is kind of the current state of the client. So what namespace you're on, uh, what filters you might have selected, and also potentially what uh, resource you're, you're looking at if you're looking at a specific resource. Um, Octant will provide that information to the plugin so that it can uh, use that to make uh, cluster calls through our plugin API to get more information about a resource, list resources, um, and and generally just like communicate uh, using uh, the Kubernetes resource types. Now, plugins can act as modules as well. Uh, these module plugins, which are all of the ones you see here on the left-hand side, are, um, they are controlling, they, they get the namespace as well as the client, but they're controlling their their calls so they're saying hey give me a list of this for for my crd i want to list all of these these resources all these objects out of it uh, and i'm going to display them uh as tables or you know as cards and um i think they're they're like this is the so this plugin here is the starboard plugin uh it's a security scanning uh tool aqua security has made this plugin and um it integrates with they have this page here, which shows you a general overview. Uh, but then, uh, as you saw previously, it integrated directly into the pod summary. So you can actually get your config reports right uh, embedded. There, that is, there's there's a couple different ways that plugins can send information into Octane. One of them is freeform through their own page. And the other one is um, through uh, what we call uh, the printer, the, the status printer, uh, summary printer and, and what those are is essentially the area within Octant that you want to render your component uh, that is determined by the type of printer that you use uh, with your plugin. The plugins themselves can define, we, we have a set of prede predetermined components that are based off of uh, Clarity UI. And so plugins, plugin authors can use those components uh, and populate them with data to render uh, render these displays. Uh, briefly, folks might not be familiar with what Clarity is. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, Clarity UI uh, is a is a CSS framework uh, that also has an Angular. So Octant on the back end is is built with Go as as well as Angular uh, on the front end. Uh, there's a Go runtime serving up uh, JSON data, and that's rendered through an Angular front end piece. Our Angular front end piece uses Clarity UI, which is a, a CSS and layout library that's open source. And um, our Octant, there's a, there's a website, which is reference.octant.dev. Uh, that is actually the, the plugin website where you can view the components that plugin authors can use uh, within Octant itself. Um, each of these is, is, a, is a plugin that was created by a group like so the Jenkins X plugin was was created by the folks at Jenkins X. Uh, there's a K native plugin. I don't have any K native uh, services installed right now, so it's not uh, particularly useful. But if if I did have them installed, you would see your services configurations and routes here. Um, I actually I don't think I have uh, any pipelines set up in Jenkins X right now either. Um, so, but th this is uh, you know this there's a demo of the Jenkins X plugin running, which you can find online. Uh, I'll get a link for it and link it in the chat uh, that shows kind of how this operates and, and you can follow your, you can follow your deployment pipelines as they run through your cluster. Uh, and it's, it's, it's pretty useful. And then this is more of a, an ops page that just shows you uh, all of the various stats as your jobs are running. Um, and then plugins here is, is kind of the list of, of plugins that are installed. And then uh, the capabilities that they have uh, registered with Octane. This is still very much a, a dev view of plugins. It's it's uh, very much an early view of like here's. It, it helps us when we're when when a plugin author is opening an issue and says, "Hey, this thing isn't working right." They can they can make sure that their plugin is registered in Octane and and registered for the set of actions they would expect and the set of resources they would expect. Um, so you can see the, the starboard one, as I mentioned before, it's registered as a module 
it's using the printer config for pod deployment, etc. cetera. Um, so, and it's using the tab uh, printer or the tab config for those as well. So that's why you see, um, that's why you'll see it in the summary view in the printer as well as uh, a unique tab for, for that. Uh, and so just to call those out in the namespace overview, because I think it's helpful. When you look at like a pod, um, uh, for example, the pod itself will have a summary view <clears throat> as well as a set of tabs. This summary view, oh, it looks like the plugin is actually currently in error. Um, I'm running an old version of the plugin with a new version of Octant. Uh, so that is my fault. It's not the Starboard folks' fault. Um, so that, that plugin tab is from Starboard and would show more data. And uh, as I mentioned before, this config audits, right? So this is, this is the printer that's, that's printing to the summary page. And uh, this is the tab that's registering a new tab for the plugin. Um, and then this is the module that the plugin has said, I want to create. Um, it becomes clear if, if you go through and you, and you do like a demo plugin, it's, it's, uh, you can kind of see the, the lanes in which a plugin can live, uh, either one or all of them. Cool. Um, I'm going to leave the witnesses in the interest of time. Uh, we might also want to just show people briefly like the, the logs and sort of a debugging workflow, but I do want to make sure um, we leave some time for Q and A. If folks uh, have questions, um, just jump in. Don't be don't be shy. I've, I've, I spent a little time with Wayne uh, a week or two ago, and I can uh, attest that he's not fragile. <laughs> and 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 um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, quickly, we'll show. So we have uh, logs, which you can you can filter down. So you say, you know, we defaulted to five minutes because as a debug tool, we kind of, um, we, we feel that like, and I, for me personally and other folks that we've talked to, like the likelihood that, that especially with your like outer loop local development, you want to see the last five minutes. You're like, don't show me all that stuff from 30 minutes ago. Uh, but as you get into maybe using it for like your, your staging environments and you're testing things out. Uh, you do kind of want to be able to see things at longer intervals. So we made it, uh, you know, configurable, but it does default to that five minute window. And then um, we also default it to just grouping all the container logs together. Um, this we found just more useful because we do provide filtering uh, and we do put the container uh, as a prefix to all the log entries. So uh, this way you don't have to go individually spelunking through all of the containers to get that aggregated view, which is is pretty helpful uh we also provide a terminal which if if there is a shell provided uh it it will or it, if the what i'm saying is if the image has some form of shell installed so sh bash uh, for windows containers uh command or powershell whatever i i don't know the exact ones for windows containers um but the, it's there. Uh, but this is the interactive terminal that you can run. Uh, I don't know if there's anything. You, yeah. So the, the it, it, it's it's full compliant. So it'll 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 run things like Vim if it's there. You know, because everyone puts Vim in their containers. Um, uh, but it, you know, top thing tool your tooling will all work here. Um, which is which is very useful. Uh, Sam Fu, one of the members of the team, uh, has been working on a uh, a, a kind of a neat debugging uh, sidecar terminal attachment thing that um, we're hoping to have here in the future. Where, in the case where your container itself doesn't support direct uh, like interactive shell because it doesn't have a a shell installed, you can attach a sidecar to it. Uh, with a shell and and drop into a, a debugging mode on that uh, on that container um, for the for the containers that that support it. So it's it's pretty cool. Uh, we're hoping to to have that pretty soon um, or sometime soon. Not this next release, but sometime. Um, and that's yeah. That I think that covers the. Oh, there's also one other thing that's pretty neat, um, which is. 
right from within. Let me see if I find something that, uh, you know, it, it'll be easier just to go to services, see if there's one in here. Uh, so there is a port forward button, um, which when you, you can start a port forward and you will get this, uh, I, you can't see it. It, it opens in a browser, but, um, yeah. And it's just showing me an error page because this endpoint is just a cache endpoint that doesn't really serve anything useful. But um, that is a localhost port forward that is is opening up, uh, you know, fifty nine nine zero one locally to that four four three endpoint in my cluster. Um, it's a pretty pretty useful. It works for services. It works for uh, anything that has a, a, a set of discoverable uh, endpoints on it. Uh, you can you can port forward to so you'll you'll see it from uh, like within pods you'll see it on certain deployments you'll see it within services um, that that you can you can activate a port forward so uh, and that is a very useful thing for quick debugging and testing where you you, you know you imagine you're you're in your you're in your container that you're trying to debug. It's not, it's running, but it's not working quite right. You're looking at logs, you're in a terminal. In the terminal, you're messing around with, with relaunching your, your server, right? Whatever, G Unicorn say. And then you have your port forward set up, right? And then all of a sudden you're refreshing that page and it starts to work. You're like, oh, let me get this config out of, out of here and, and go fix my thing and rebuild my image and push it up. Um, it's a, a pretty common workflow that we see people using. And um, one other thing, we do we're we're starting to work on on this. We we've had this kind of in flight for a while. It's very uh, um, you know POC proof of concept, but uh, this is kind of we're trying to create this idea of like a, a workloads or an applications and a quick view dashboard. So you come into your namespace and what you see is, is all of your workloads. And if there's metrics or stats for them, you, you kind of get a quick view of them. Uh, and within these cards, uh, ideally we would, we would have some form of like, uh, what we would call like an object status or a score or tally of like, Hey, what's, what's kind of a running health of this thing, uh, over the last, you know, small window of time five minutes, 10 minutes, uh, something something reasonable for an in-memory uh, time series for Octant to actually pay attention to and care about. Um, and then when you click into these, it's kind of, uh, you know, that hybrid view of, hey, that application card, uh, as well as the resource viewer that we explored previously, where I can now see, hey, here's my, it's my last set of events and, and here's, here's all of the things that are connected to this. And this is very much a work in progress and we would love any feedback or thoughts, suggestions about what might be useful to, to have in, in an applications type view like that. And, and for rendering applications, we're working with the uh, Kubernetes, uh, apps.kubernetes.io set of recommended application labels is, is where we start. And then we also do uh, like owner and, and parent ref as a way to, to further connect things that might be related. Uh, PR is absolutely welcome. So the question from Matt Young, Matt Young was, how can folks engage with the project? PR is welcome. Uh, yes, PRs, issues. We have a GitHub discussions as well. Um, open to feedback, uh, PRs, any in any form. <laughs> um, plugins, uh, if you're interested in crafting or creating plugins, you can come into the uh, hashtag Octant channel on the Kubernetes Slack and, and ask about, uh, you know, plugin authoring and, committing to upstream, all, all of those things. Uh, yes, would, would love to have folks get involved. Cool. Um, are yeah, there any questions? Yeah, question. Yeah, well, <laughs> any other questions from, from someone else here in the park? Hi, um, it's Olga, I, I just joined. And uh, I was wondering how does uh, Octant uh, compare to, for example, K9, so maybe there are other solutions like that. What's, what's the 
benefits is it like um, different kind of uh, GUI or is it plugins or something else? Uh, yeah, I, so I think it's 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 a couple things. Um, mainly, it's it's a plugin model and a um, which I, I if I recall, I think was it K9s working on plugins? Someone was just recently added plugins to their kind of cluster, uh, you know, Kubernetes view. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's it's mostly our plugin model uh, that that makes us different, and also we're really trying to focus on. Uh, that developer target uh, of of like early like early outer loop, uh, early inner loop, like real like less because because we we have a lot of actions in here like you can delete things you can edit the YAML right in place you can do a lot of things that uh, you don't want to do in a production cluster uh, like when you're deployed to production with Octant uh, or when you're deployed to production there's a lot of uh, activities that you can do with Octant that you might not want to do, which can be solved by just scoping down the config. But um, yeah, our, 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 our primary goal is, is to enable Kubernetes developers to have a customizable dashboard to enhance their overall development experience and better understand the workloads that are running, like their workloads as they're running. Um, and that, so that's our primary focus. So, so we tend to stray away from some of the more uh, ops type things and, and ops views that, that a lot of, uh, other, um, like Kubernetes viewers, uh, have built in, um, just because, uh, they kind of distract, they're, they're distracting a small team from the focus of making this thing as good as possible for developers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Olga, for the question. I will add that also, uh, you know, being myself a, a Kubernetes administrator in, in some, some time ago, Octane has something different because it's uh, aiming to, to approach the troubleshooting experience, for example, debugging experience, uh, you know, showing more the relationships between objects in a Kubernetes environment. You know, there in, in a Kubernetes cluster, there are a lot of objects, uh, resources, controllers, etc. So uh, the the goal of Octan is to to accelerate uh, developer experiences, like for example, troubleshooting, uh, by uh, making a, a view, uh, you know, well, graphical sense on the relationships and, and everything inside Kubernetes. Uh, I find it different because of that in, in some ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I got a question uh, privately in Slack. Uh, uh, you know, is it a local desktop app or, you know, I think when a lot of people saw this last, it was probably something running on localhost that you run as a local Angular thing. Um, could you, could you, Briefly, just give a description of like you know what is Octant. It, it looks like a desktop app here. Um, yes, yeah. So Octant is a application. Um, there, there is a web server component to it that is written in Go, but that is just there to be consumed by uh, an Electron front end. Um, it it is an application with a long term goal of being uh, being able to leverage some of that uh, tight desktop integration through uh, allowing you to set up if you want to be alerted or, or uh, you know, imagine you're, you're doing some things within your cluster uh, through say the AWS console or something like that. And you have Octant running uh, minimized. If I minimize this, it goes down into the tray. So you, you, Octant's running down in the tray and then uh, something happens, something, uh, you know, you apply some new YAML and it breaks or a PR emerges and, and uh, and your, your dev cluster has been updated and now a deployment fails and you see the little, you know, toast pop up saying, Hey, this, and you click on it. And now you're, you're staring right at your deployment that had just failed due to the PR that you had submitted. Um, again, that's very much that, that local development developer centric kind of model that we're, that we're pushing for. Um, and, and I think that's why, uh, the, the analogy to, you know, kind of being the, the VS code for, for Kubernetes local is, is, or Kubernetes developers running locally is what 
is what we are hoping to achieve eventually with these plugins and, and the extensibility of the platform. One more question. So um, how would you kind of uh, estimate or evaluate how long would it take for a new person, a new developer who never worked with Octant? How long will it take to get up to speed? Is it just like a matter of installing it uh, and uh, then pointing to the cluster or to really use it, you need to figure out which plugins to use, etc. like configure dashboards? Yeah, that's a great question. So the everything that I've shown ex minus the stuff that's in Starboard and the Jenkins X K native on the, on the plugin menus on the left ships with Octant by default. Uh, when you install Octant and you run, uh, you run it, it will do best effort to find your cube config. Uh, it looks, uh, it, it actually, when you start it up, it, it tells you, hey, this is where I found your, your current path. Now, if it can't find a valid cube config file, it actually prompts you to paste one in. Um, we're, we're working, I, I don't recall if we, uh, I should know this, but I think it will prompt you to paste one in or allow you to do the your local file picker, another benefit of us being an application, uh, local file picker to go to the cube config that you want to use. Uh, and then once you provide it with a cube config, uh, it will uh, attempt to connect to that context to that cluster and and uh, you know if you have the permissions, it will auto uh, auto discover your namespaces and start to uh, start up your informers so that it can populate caches to show you your resources and and provide you updates. Uh, all of that just kind of works. You don't have to configure or set up anything as long as you have a the, the kind of the 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 way we say is if if kubectl works, Octant should work. Mm-hmm. Nice. Thank you. And I would say that we are working we are working on that to improve even for that experience because uh, we are working on providing even better default views uh, to accelerate even more uh, you know time it takes for a new developer to to get up to speed. So um yeah, compared probably with, with other options, uh, it's it's quite fast. And yeah, you have a, an option there. Uh, so Octane inform you where is located the kubeconfig file. And you just need to feed that, to provide the kubeconfig file, and that's it. So, yeah, but but it's, it's still a work in progress to improve that even better. Great. Um, as we're running short on time, are there any other questions or um, is there anything you want to uh, uh, highlight, Wayne, or other members of the Akron team about sort of the, the project's positioning uh, in the open source landscape or, um, you know, uh, what might you say to, you know, the hundreds of projects in the CNCF that, that may or may not be interested in, in, in plugins? Um, as a yeah absolutely um so i would say uh well we're you know apache 2 license so that makes it easy uh we also are um if you are interested in if you are a project that has some crds that go along with your project and you want to have a ui for those objects that ultimately get created from those crds and you don't want to have to have a have a, a UI server deployed and and write a UI and write TypeScript or JavaScript and, and 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 do all of that and you just want to make it convenient for people to get information about your objects interact with them uh, and, and 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 surface useful information about it uh, I would highly recommend checking out writing an Octant plugin because that is what we very much are intended to do is is to to create a bridge so that people can easily view their resources uh in this case people being plugin authors and their and their users of those of, of those custom resources easily view them understand them better and um without having to have 
uh, a whole new set of, of knowledge about how to go and write a UI. We, we kind of, we put you in a box essentially and say like, here's, here's what you can do. And it's, and you can pick the TypeScript Avenue or you can pick the Go Avenue and, and, uh, and here are your components and, and here's your resources from the server, right? Like, uh, it, it's a very nice experience for people who, uh, just want to write go, <laughs> but it's also a nice experience for people who, uh, don't want to have to, uh, manage some other UI component. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, uh, for, for joining us and doing a show and tell this will be on YouTube later in our, in our YouTube channel. Um, I noticed we, I think we have some new faces here that we've not seen before. Um, Matt, 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 can I have a quick question before we, oh, yeah, uh, over, just, just a very quick one, just to make, in case I missed it, behind this project, it's just, is it just uh, uh, VMware Tanzu? Is there any other uh, involved parties uh, behind uh, supporting this project? Uh, so right now, primarily upstreams all VMware employees. There are external contributors who have contributed in the past, and we would love to get more external folks contributing to the project and make it not siloed by VMware. That would be really great. I think you have yeah. open community meetings as well, right? Is it we weekly do, yes. or bi-weekly? Uh, yeah, we have weekly open community meetings on Wednesdays. Cool. And you can um, find those on uh, octant.dev. Great. That, that'd be important to encourage also the collaboration, I guess, with the CNCF ecosystem uh, to, to make sure that uh, it's open for, uh, for contributions and for uh, additional maintainers. And stuff. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We have, uh, it's documented both our process to becoming a contributor, uh, like becoming an Octant owner and being part of, uh, like essentially getting the commit bit is all documented. Uh, and it follows some of the guidance that's provided just as in Kubernetes upstream. Great. Thank you. Sorry, Matt, the floor is yours. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I, again, I'm, I'm happy if, if folks just want to discuss, um, but I did want to just provide a, a brief opportunity for folks that have not been to one of our meetings before to, to introduce yourself uh, optionally. Um, and, and also uh, in, in the document, uh, the Google Doc, uh, feel free to put your contact info there and, and sign in as an attendee. Yeah, I don't know. I mentioned myself, I'm Olga Kopilova. I'm working for Adobe with focus on observability. Uh, so I'm trying to look into everything related to observability. Uh, my big focus is to look into uh, external developer observability, which is, I think, a little bit more rare than just observability, which is usually focused on the internal teams who observe their applications. I'm trying to understand how we can provide observability capabilities for uh, external developers who, who build products based on Adobe solutions. And uh, hi, my name is Avi Press. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of a startup called Scarf. Um, and we make tools to help open source maintainers have observability about their containers and how they um, you know, distribute them via different container registries. And they can actually understand like how those containers are getting pulled down and you know, like what cloud environments and companies are using them. Um, so it's a little bit of a, another yeah, different angle on the observability, but still very relevant to, to what we try to do and help uh, get both to maintainers and end users. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Shantanu. Uh, I work as a site reliability engineer in Deutsche Bank, and um, I work mostly in areas of site reliability engineering observ and observability. Oh, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, Richie, is there anything else uh, you want to cover today? No, I mean, there's uh, Dotan and I did a, did a podcast thing today that's linked in the in, in the meeting docs um i think the question will just move to next time this will this would be the second no the third time i think in our history that we actually stop on on the 10 before we can also run over but i think we should actually try and not uh, uh to actually give people their um toilet breaks <laughs> yeah. um Truth be told, I think it was almost a year before I even realized it was a 50, not 60 minute meeting. Um. I, sorry, I also added a, a topic to the agenda. Could uh, I ask, could, could I have guidance on that on, on the Slack channel? 
Mm. That's uh, what yeah. benefits could Prometheus operator get from donating the project? Uh, it's fine to to do that on Slack. Um, yeah. Do Do you want to give a brief overview for those that might not already be in our Slack or or might not know? I I know what you're talking about, but um, do you want to just describe sort of the the, the set the set the set the table uh, for a discussion in Slack, if you will, Arthur? Yeah, it's, it's just uh, we are uh, previous operator team is uh, discussing if we want to donate the project or not. And we have a lot of doubts. Uh, what are the benefits? We're just asking for guidance, to be honest, not really a discussion. So as to specific benefits, um, once you are in incubation state uh, stage, and that is obviously uh, quite some time after the um, sandbox stage, uh, you get PR support by CNCF, which means um, I think only for graduated you can actually have like a, like a, a webinar every year or some such. Um, you get on the maintainers track of KubeCon, you get uh, one uh, certain slot for incubated and I think two uh, with 101 and deep dive for all graduated projects. Um, and you get, you get process support like um, so if you have your call, you can put this on the CNCF calendar. Um, you can you can get something on YouTube under the CNCF umbrella. Um, those are the most direct ones. Like there's obviously fame and fortune. Um, it might make sense to, now I'm switching hats. Uh, you could also consider putting this under Prometheus or Prometheus community, but if not, no worries. Um, back to the other hat. Um, those are the main. Those are the main benefits from a long-time project member's point of view, because with my Prometheus head on, we we've had those for like since since I've existed, and this is this is what what actually uh, moves the needle from the project point of view. I'll follow up in Slack as well. Um, you might want to reach out to Cheryl, uh, who's VP of Ecosystem at the CNCF. Mm -hmm. Um, there are some decks uh, that I could, I think there's probably more updated versions from her mind. The, 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 the link I have is about uh, three quarters of a year old, uh, but there is some materials and collateral uh, that, that goes into in, in depth uh, what it means to join, why you would want to join. Um, and there's, there's a whole arm of the CNCF that, that's aimed squarely at answering that question uh, and that you can engage with. So I'll follow up in Slack with some links uh, if you like. That would be awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, yeah. Um, so thanks again, everybody. Um, we have all manner of business we could look, go, go through in GitHub, but I think that'll be for uh, the next meeting. Uh, there's no, uh, I, I think we're plus four minutes. So uh, sorry, Richie, we're not going to end right at 50. <laughs> um, sure. Yeah. I mean, if there's nothing else, thank you, everyone. Um, oh, yeah. And, and thank you to the Octane team for joining us and giving a demo. Um, we'll post this to our YouTube channel um, uh, later on today. Uh, I will get into doing that. I've not always been uh, super timely, but um, we'll, we'll make sure this is posted. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.